movie and it's very expensive when you're in form of paupers to hang on the line and nothing done? Can you reach him for me? Okay, nothing said. What time is it, Chris? Barbara Goldberg. says that Manhattan has dropped the uh, community sponsor. This is Thomas J. Hogarten. Please leave your name and your phone number and we'll return your call as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, number one, I just talked to Grafman and he said that he had talked to you and that you seemed like a bright young man. No, Graceman has nothing to do with Positively Jewish and hasn't had for years. Uh, number two, I was given the wrong date for the videotaping of ACAP. I'm a public access producer and you should be one too. But I went down there yesterday and I was very upset that I had been given the wrong date. And I know who gave it to me and I have it on audio tape. Uh, but it turned out very nice because uh, the public access producers of Manhattan were having a meeting at 5 o'clock and they invited me to that. And it was really good. And your name was mentioned. And you were well known there. Uh, number three, I didn't get anything from you on uh, Cablevision uh, not letting me see the books, records, and minutes as a shareholder. Uh, let's see, number four, there was another bulletin to tell you. Uh, Mike Mastrangelo has left Riverhead. Mike Mastrangelo was at uh, 
uh, Brookhaven for four years. I knew him well, and I'm very sad that he has left. Uh, let's see. Well, the picnic that I spoke to you about, I said, let's have a picnic. We're uh, trying to have it at uh, Goldberg's house. Uh, Bob and Barbara are talking that over to have a picnic at Goldberg's house. I hope the correct date is July 20th for the Belvedere Castle one. Do you happen to know? Uh, I sent you some material that I picked up at QPTV that I think you will be interested in. I do not see why you do not sue uh, QPTV for making you wait over a year for your public access training. That is limiting and prohibiting public access, and that's Public Service Law uh, 229. I just asked the Public Service Commission to send me a copy of that. Uh, okay, those are the bulletins for the moment that I can think of. Bye-bye. Phil Goldstein. Talk to me? Will he come to the phone? Yeah, I did start in 74, I guess. There's hardly anybody that started before then, so... That's right. 
like before 74? Because you and George Stoney are like the parents of that. <laughs> George Stoney, what is he doing, by the way? Is he still at NYU? He's still on our board. Yeah, and is he, is he at NYU? Yeah. Yeah? I know somebody that got an award of Fred Strauss. Do you know him up at White Plains? He got an award from George Stoney in Washington, D.C. years ago. Oh, I, I got that award about two years ago. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, great! Yeah, for lifetime and access, I'm half his age, so... <laughs> okay, that was it. I would just... I I'm always glad to hear, you know, if you ever just want to, want to call and say something good, tell them to put you through no matter what. Oh, really? Yeah, because I, I get so much bad stuff here. Oh, and, well, that's sad. Anyway, it's a great operation, and as I walked around, and I videotaped a lot of it for the other people to see, particularly the Glaston uh, uh, editing booths, I think that's spectacular. I remember when Cablevision was going to move us out of Hicksville. Hicksville was a tremendous uh, head in. Were you in Hicksville? No, not anymore. They moved us out. Uh, but when they were moving us out and planning down in Lindbergh, they would keep calling me in and say, "Well, what, what is it you do, and how? What do you use? What kind of equipment? You, what is it you want to walk out of here with?" And they pretty much designed Lindbergh uh, to fit those specs. And anyhow, I said, "Are you going to have glass in editing booths like Manhattan Neighborhood Network?" They said, well, no, we don't think so. We're getting ready to do some non-linear ones, but we might not go ask those in. <laughs> so really? We, yeah, because we think, you know, the non-linear stuff, it really is such a group process. The learning is such a group process that we really think that um, we sort of need to have people to be able to um, interact a little bit more in order to learn from each other. Oh!
5 p.m. because nobody showed up for the 1 p.m. editing. I think that's fantastic. I'd love to have you see what they did over there. And that's just one of their systems. I use uh, their three-quarter inch, half-inch system. Isn't that marvelous? Yeah, it is. Things are coming around well. Yeah. Well, good to talk to you, Anthony. Uh, keep the courage flaming. Keep up the good work. And you're making that public access stronger all the time. Thanks a lot. I'm getting to that. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye-bye. Uh, Jane Ann Murray, Mr. and Mrs. Franklin Buell cordially invite you to dinner on August the 10th at uh, 6 p.m. on or about 914-949-9495. Uh, Paul Feiner. Uh, Paul Feiner, it's Glendora and Franklin. Uh, we have to do something about system-wide public access. I had some work done by a handyman named Frank. He lives in Hartsdale. And he told me how you uh, took care of the covers on his uh, garbage cans, that they were all over the lawns of other people and out in the street and that after he told you it was taken care of right away. We have to do something about system-wide public access. You cannot change a franchise in the middle of, uh, you can't change the terms in the middle of a franchise without the permission of the uh, municipality. And it says that very clearly uh, in the law. And I just don't know why you don't go after Cablevision and tell them that they had no right to do that and get them to give us back system-wide public access. They went to you, you had three peg channels, they went to you and they said, give us back one. Get that down. I wanted to call Tom Gardner, has that number come up? Thanks to that voted to aging on this Oh, hello, may I talk to you? Public Service Commission, New York State, now contains the uh, old Cable Television Commission. Hi, Thomas, Franklin Glendora. We just uh, want to 
just to tell you that everything's going very well. We appreciate it. We're very happy with it. Uh, the editing at Lindbrook uh, just goes on every week and is perfect. We only get so much done. And uh, Amy Colombo is so good about giving us specials. Uh, when she has empty hold, we send her uh, additional tapes. And uh, Diane Bennett and Amy Van Horn are so good at that too. And so we're very, very happy with it. So we just wanted to give you the good word. And uh, you got anything else to say, Franklin? What do you shake your head for? Is it loose? <laughs> Can't you say something to Tom? Hello, Tom. Hope you're enjoying the weekend. <laughs> and Mark uh, Shukin calls us up. I call him up. Uh, and he calls us up, and he says that the network industry is moving so fast it makes the television industry look as though it's standing still. The internet, not the network. What did I say? Okay, the internet uh, industry is moving so fast it makes uh, television look as though it's standing still. Uh, Manhattan uh, Public Access is starting up digital editing. Uh, next week they're going to start installing it. And they have about seven glassed-in editing booths. I was down there yesterday, and they have seven uh, glassed-in editing suites. They're really very, very nice. And I went down because ACAP, the Association of Cable Access, uh, ACAP, Association of Cable Access Producers, uh, were videotaping a show in the studio. I have 15 seconds to finish recording. And. Uh, it was on uh, why I am a public access producer and urging other people to become a public access producer. And they are having a picnic at the Belvedere Castle on uh, August the 20th, and you're invited as my guest uh, at noon. Recorded. To re-record. Oh, good. How's it going? Everything's going okay. That's good. You got your editing time and everything? Okay, Kelly. Kelly Burns. That's on your call, though. Yeah. And I uh, tell your mother that this woman said she had the most wonderful recipe for casserole. Uh-huh. Yeah, every time she mentioned it, her husband said, let's eat out. <laughs> okay. Okay, Kelly. Take care. This is the Delaware Court, United States District Court, Delaware. Listen to this. Tell your mother that this woman you, said you she had the most wonderful number. casserole. Uh-huh. Yeah, every time she... <laughs> okay. Okay, Kelly. Bye-bye. 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 Listen. Over court time. The person you are calling does not wish to talk. They won't pick up the phone unless you uh, unblock your number and, and dial star 82. A United States District Court. Okay. Uh, gee, I have that number here, but it's mixed up with other number. Is this number uh, uh, 6001? Oh, oh, one. McKelvey. Is that his number? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Is, is it hard for you to switch me? Um, actually, I can't transfer you. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. That's okay. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. That's the chief judge. This is uh, Glendora versus Casari, Cher, Generoso, Rice, and a court officer. Liberty, this is Judge Roderick or Nick Olding. No one is available to answer your call at this time. However, if you leave your name, number, and a brief message, someone will return your call. Uh, hello, it's Glendora. I'm calling about the case, uh, the status of my case, Glendora versus uh, Ishvan Casari. Uh, my number is 914-949-9495. And thank you. Bye-bye. Number. Karen Moore, Glendora, 
Corps has not received a summons. Area code 914-949-9495. We need our summons signed by the clerk because all the plaintiffs are pro se. Thank you. Box 416, White Plains, New York, 10602. Thank you. United States District Court, St. Louis. Galgano versus James L. Dolan. Uh, Glendora to Texaco about the Equal Opportunity Task Force. A big joke. No help. Uh, yes, is Mr. Hutchins in? I have a meeting, man. Are you on the call? Uh, yes, could you please call Glenny? Mr. Glenny? Yes, G-L-E-N-N-I-E. -N -N -E. Okay, the phone number? Thank you, 914. 914? Yes, please, 949. 9495. Matthew, what's your name? Yes, I'm trying to restore my 1980 Lincoln Continental Mark. Isn't that great? 
showing up for a local sponsor requirement. A resident requirement. Thank you for calling Beacon. Brooklyn Community Access Television. If you know your party's extent, please hold for the operator. Did you hear that woman's voice? She's uh yeah, I'd like to know the hours for a tape pickup and drop off. Yeah, going to 7 o'clock. Monday through Friday from 10 to 7, Saturday from 10 to 4. Monday through Friday, uh, 10 to 7, and Saturday, 10 to 4. 10 to 4. Thank you. Okay. Then how come I couldn't pick up my tapes that day? Jim Cahagan oh, and Helen. Is something good to tell him? Uh, no, but that means we can't talk to you both. Oh, <laughs> I know. But you see, I have to uh, take his car to have something fixed on it. Okay. Uh, I think it was something with the break where the pants fell off or something, whatever it is. Okay, did you see the program lately? Uh, Rock on time. of communication and trust, I think that uh, it's necessary to really uh, unite and uh, producers do need a voice. So I, I think I, I, that's about all I can say actually because uh, at this moment I haven't really had time to go over a lot of these uh, laws that entitle the producers to a great many more uh, rights than they think now that they have uh, the right to. And uh, I, I won't elaborate on that since I'm not really versed in it. Uh, but you will be hearing from other uh, producers this evening that perhaps are a little bit better versed on it. Uh, but if you uh, feel that CTV has been a, a home for you, uh, or you had a place here in the past, <coughs> or uh, you have a voice that you want to be heard as a producer, then I think we should uh, come on down or look into our organization, BCAP. Thank you. And I do a show, I co-produce a show with the Amelia Arena and Frank Dudley, it's called the UFO Phenomenon. I also do a program called the Astronomy Forum. The purpose of these shows are to educate people. Uh, I would just like to uh, let the, uh, the audience out there in TV land let them know that last week I was at a board meeting and I felt like I was in a movie. It was a scene like in the 1800s. It, was, it seemed like a lynching was going on. There was a pit bull loose, and, and the exact to do with um, CTV producers and our future here. Um, I would also um, like to say that, um, well, let me introduce Anna from, uh, the uh, Manhattan and Queens uh, uh, TV production studios there. And she has an organization that would benefit all uh, producers in the future. And then I'll take the microphone back. And I just want to say that I would like to uh, bridge the gap and I welcome Anna here, Anna Vitale. And maybe Anna, you can tell the uh, producers and the general public what's going on in Queens and the five boroughs. Okay, I'm so happy you invited me to be here tonight. My name is Anna Vitale. I'm the president of the Association of Cable Access Producers. We started our organization for the very same reason you guys are joining together. Because public access is really a tool for the people and it's becoming a tool for bureaucrats. It's becoming mishandled. It's, it's not what it ought to be. And ACAP, the Association of Cable Access Producers, is beginning to unite all producers from all boroughs, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and we're hoping to embrace you guys in Staten Island. We need to stick together. We need to, to have a voice in this public access. Uh, we're reaching out to everybody, and we're getting people's response because it seems to be a widespread situation. It's not only in Staten Island, it's in Queens. 
It's in Manhattan. Produces at the public access facilities in the other four boroughs that similar conditions exist all over our town. I'm also told, folks. And now, for Staten Island and Manhattan, Queens, and uh, oh yes, here we are. You're on the camera okay. three. Uh, so through these people, when you get down here, show your interest, send the letters in, send the email address. Do you guys have an email address here? www.sictv.org. Okay, that's a website address. Do you have an email address? Send it goes. To Go to the website, you'll find the email. Okay, go to their website, find the email. Be happy, be happy. Sam, and I am a community access producer since 1993. Um, I should say at the top of this, I am also a member of VCAP, the Volunteer Community Access Producers and Providers. Uh, I am also uh, Mr. Gary Bartell's friend and have been for 30 years. Uh, that said, um, you heard a number of VCAP folks talking up here about the despicable display uh, that was put on uh, by the board of directors um, at their meeting just the other day. Um, it, it's, it's beyond disturbing you know, the way that they were dealing with that. And it makes me think that uh, William DeLucio must resign. Uh, that's behavior that no human being should have to undergo. Uh, the stress uh, and duress that he put Gary in meetings for the producers group. Hello, you're not setting meetings for any of us. Mm -hmm. The way you get that notion that you can set meetings for the producers group, uh, but that's out the window right away. The executive director may be required to attend these meetings. The president of the board yeah, shall yeah. establish at least one board yeah, meeting yeah, on Okay. Uh, 
Consensi continued, why is a judge afraid of the DA? Why is a United States judge afraid of the U.S. attorney? We don't know that. But the DA was Piro. Uh, the DA was, was Piro. Of course, it was in a different court system. Her husband got convicted. Yeah. Uh, and of course, and another thing is this is that uh, uh, I think the conviction is totally wrong. And, uh, and no, we're talking about a judge being afraid of the DA. Yeah. So uh, in, in that particular court situation, no, he, well, he the, the reason why the judge was not afraid is because the lawyer was taking orders from the owners of both of them, who was the U.S. attorney. And in other words, the judge was not looking to do justice. He was looking to appease the DA, and he had the... Uh, appease the U.S. attorney? Appease the U.S. attorney, yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Why are judges afraid of the U.S. attorney? They're afraid of it because of the whole, what I just, lawyers do not have a, uh, a collective bargaining agreement, and when, and when they, uh, when, when they threaten the system, Immediately they gang up, Every or everybody gangs up on them, including the Bar Association. Yes, but why is a United States judge afraid of a U.S. attorney? Because of exactly what I said is that the U.S. attorney will, will let the word be known, and before you know it, look at this is what happened to Judge Convoy. Uh, judge Convoy got himself, because he was uh, a crook, and he and Giuliani uh, manufactured his uh, uh, his record of being a, uh, an accomplice in the uh, uh, operation of the police pension fund. Well, was he or wasn't he? Was Convoy an accomplice? Uh, of course he was. Well, then the... And then, he had to quit. He was forced to quit or they're going to send him to jail. No, no, that doesn't answer why is a judge afraid of a U.S. attorney. Not a judge who is a crook, but why is a judge afraid of a U.S. attorney? Because the U.S. attorney can Marvin Frankel. Marvin uh, Frankel. Uh, Mar uh, Mar uh, Marvin Frankel. He, he, he became a partner in uh, Montrose, uh, not Montrose, in, in Proskow Rose. In Proskow Rose. Judge who became a partner in Proskow Rose was forced to resign from the judge, but they didn't prosecute him because he was manipulating uh, decisions in the management of a, uh, uh, an OSHA, OSHA fund, an OSHA funded uh, uh, labor organization. Every U.S. judge is afraid of a U.S. attorney? Sometimes, well, let me put it to you this way. Uh, depending on the circumstances, because they give these people uh, uh, channels of, uh, of, they give them space. And if they if they if they break the spatial the spatial tolerance, uh, th that's when the uh, uh, the retaliatory uh, the retaliatory response becomes a threat to the judge. The U.S. attorneys? Yes, yes. The U.S. attorneys are all run by a gangsterhood of of a secret government, and that's the re and that's the reason why lawyers need a uh, uh, need a collective bargaining agreement. Look at the lawyer. Yes, yes, we got that point. But I want to know why is what can the U.S. attorneys do to a U.S. judge? He can have him. He can he can make trouble for him. And he'll what they'll do is they'll transfer him to uh, uh, to Alaska or some other place. Uh, they'll uh, into an area where. You How can U.S. attorneys do that? They do that because the U.S. attorneys are not appointed by the people of the United States. They are appointed by uh, a gangster hood that is run by, in the Second Circuit, when I was uh, practicing, uh, uh, the, uh, the guy who uh, ran the place was a guy named Judah Gribbett. And he's a thug. He's the president of the major Jewish uh, uh, organization. Okay, so a U.S. A judge, a U.S. district judge,
judge is afraid of a U.S. attorney. That's right. Is the circuit judge afraid of a U.S. attorney? They all, they all can be. What it is is they operate within, you know, it's like a driver's license. If you drive while you're drunk, they pull it away from you. Now, it's the same thing with the judge. The judge has the metaphor of driving while he's drunk. If he makes the, he makes the U.S. attorney too unhappy. And, of course, this is what... And the U.S. attorney then is always going to win. A U.S. attorney is always going to win, yes. <clears throat> These chats with Glendora occurred, folks, uh, that one occurred on Saturday, July the 3rd, 29th. This is Hero. Uh, Crescenzi, Crescenzi speculates that the U.S. attorney wanted to bring Piro down because she was building an empire, and the empire was getting too big and too successful. There's, there's certainly something uh, inviting about uh, believing that from what you see and what you read. Wilbur McRaney. 
He sues judges, and he should. Well, Gene Pacente is so right about that, that U.S. judges are afraid of U.S. attorneys. Uh, particularly, I would think U.S. magistrate judges are afraid of U.S. attorneys, because the U.S. magistrate judge is there for only something like eight years, and they have to be reappointed. And if they don't uh, do what the U.S. attorneys want them to do, uh, then they're not going to get reappointed. So that means that the U.S. attorney is going to win every time. It's a hoax. I have personal knowledge of this, because Azraq, Joan M. Azraq, was scared stiff of Edgardo Ramos. Scared stiff of him. She got down on her knees to him, all through the litigation and all through the trial. We're good, how are you? Good, I'm just helping, uh, giving a tour of the library now. Oh, you are? Yes, but uh, what, what can I help you with? Uh, Indianapolis and Cleveland. Uh, okay. Uh, the woman uh, said to the, she was in the artist studio, and she said to the artist, your colors are beautiful. I wish I could take some of your colors home with me. And the artist says, oh, you will, ma'am. You're sitting on my brushes. <laughs>
Uh, it used to be on Mondays and Saturdays. Uh, yeah, well, according to the schedule, no longer, it no longer does. So there's a new schedule? There's a new schedule, you said? Yes, uh, Shadow and Grow Up. Shadow and Grow Up only comes on 7 o'clock. Uh, uh, when, when did the new schedule come out? It is effective January 28th. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, did they notify anybody of that? I'm not sure. I mean, it is effective June 28th. June 28th? Yes. Oh, I didn't get any notice of that. Uh, well, you have to call back on Monday and speak to you there, uh, Mr. Stooks or Mr. Shrub. Uh, can you put on Fred's uh, telephone answering machine? Uh, you have to call back either Monday or... Uh, if you don't answer, Fred's answering machine will answer. Alright, the answering machine is on. You either call back Monday or... Tuesday. Yeah, I could do that tonight. If you don't answer. Alright, then I will answer. Just okay. call right back and I will. Yeah, I'll call back and then you don't answer and then his machine will come on and I'll ask him. Okay, bye. Okay, thank you. I hate those car alarms. The curse on society.
Rockland County. He's getting ready his TV program. Roy, I'm going to buy you a telephone answering machine. Uh, it's Bondor and Franklin. Well, we haven't heard from you so long. Thank you for picking up the tapes at Riverhead. I was delighted to hear that. Thank you for mailing us the tapes from Hicksville. We were delighted to get those. Uh, we're going to see you Tuesday. Is that right? Tuesday, August 1st? Around uh, what time is good for you? I, I think I've got to go back to that crazy uh, Great Neck. I got there at 520 last Tuesday and they were closed. I got to go back to that crazy Queens. I got there at 620 and they were closed. Uh, let's see. Did you uh, make your demand to see the books, records, and minutes as you are entitled to see because you are an owner of the company? You're a shareholder. Uh, we have to talk to you. Um, so call us. A lot has been going on. I met with Manhattan neighborhood network producers and uh, and the ACAP, the Association of Cable Access Producers, uh, did a show on why uh, each one said why he, she was a public access producer and why uh, the audience should become access producers and so forth. I did nine shows on Tuesday plus 15, 16 dubs and uh, okay, Lori program has a new format, but you never see it. Bye-bye. This is Don Hawbaker, Selma Council at the First Circuit Court of Appeals. I'm either in a settlement conference or otherwise unavailable to take your call. If you need to speak with my assistant, Irene Gamble, her direct number is 617-748-9339. Please leave a message after the tone. Uh, I haven't heard from you people lately, and that is good, and this is Glendora. Uh, the Fifth Circuit is almost as bad as the First Circuit. Uh, they betrayed America, too, and made fools of themselves. And so uh, the case in which uh, uh, Young, William Young, and uh, Anastas, our defendants, uh, will be brought again in another district court. And what are you going to do uh, about that one? What cheat are you going to pull off here? Your last cheat was to make believe uh, that the case was filed in your court when it wasn't. This is going to be filed in another U.S. District Court. And you think we're going to go through the appeals process again, the little game that you play? 914-949-9495. Uh, Corey's telephone answering machine says it's beautiful weather, the birds are singing, it's summer. is a number that security well, gave me. I'm recording the other number. Yeah, well, there aren't any operators there until tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. Do you have Mr. Rui's direct dial number? I do not. Oh, I think you do. I think you do. Our computer is down right now. I can't get into it. Our computer is down now. He gave me a number, and the number he gave me was disconnected. <laughs> To Frank Craven. Has anything happened? Got any news? I certainly enjoyed your meeting. I was certainly enjoyed all of you people.
took a chat with Glendora off of the TV uh, because, on information and belief, Glendora was reporting that James Picken, Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, Nassau County, and Thomas Galata, County Executive, were not protecting you, the consumers of uh, Nassau County, because uh, they were letting Scott Lord operate an underground lawn, sprink lawn sprinkling uh, system without uh, a Consumer Affairs license. Uh, upon information and belief, uh, these two, uh, Pickin and uh, Galata, uh, got a hold of Cablevision and said, get Glendora off of TV, and Cablevision in its ignorance and arrogance did that. Uh, I brought three lawsuits against them for this. They broke a state law and they broke a federal law. Uh, one was uh, Glendora versus Cablevision, Glendora versus Charles F. Dolan, and Glendora versus James M. Kofal. Uh, strong evidence that I was right uh, is that uh, immediately Kofal was fired. And this was seven years ago. And Kofal uh, found a job down in North Carolina someplace. He was the only person, non-Dolan, who had risen that far. He was president of Cablevision Systems Corporation, and his is the name and the signature on my stock certificate. For seven years, I have tried to get a hold of James Colfall and make him talk. But you know people in Cablevision. They lie, and they cover up. They do bad things, then they cover up. And then you catch them, and they lie more, and they cover up more. Uh, finally, uh, last night, on uh, July the 30th, 2000, Anno Domini, I called James Colfall at his number in North Carolina. And I said, James Colfall. He said, speaking. I said, who asked you to take a chat with Glendora off of TV? Here is the audio tape. Uh, who asked you to take a chat with Glendora off of Cablevision? He hung up. He said nothing. Okay, that was on uh, James July 30th, 2000, at uh, 5.31 p.m. James I've been trying that number for five years. Four Seven. years. Seven. There's some dates here somewhere. Ninety-three. And I finally get him. And he hung up. That's good. We have this on record, folks. Uh, James A. Colfault was the former president of Cablevision. And it was in 1993 that Cablevision took a chat with Glendora off of TV uh, on information and belief at the bit of James Pickin and Thomas Galata because Glendora was saying that the Department of Consumer Affairs was not protecting you consumers in Nassau County by letting Scott Lord operate an underground law and sprinkler system without a license from the Consumer Affairs Department. And very soon after Glendora sued and made Kofal the lead defendant, he was fired. And he left. And he went to South Carolina or North Carolina or something. He was the highest any non-Dolan had ever gone in that company, president. And it was his signature that was on my stock certificate. So I finally get him after seven years, and he hung up. He ran away. But the way all cable vision people do. Did. They do something wrong. He's made aware that it isn't forgotten. They run away. He certainly remembers the case. He hung up quickly enough. Robert S. Lemley, Executive Vice President, Cablevision. Robert 
the Federal Communications Commission requires cable operators to maintain various documents and records of their authorization and operation for inspection by the Commission, local franchising authorities, and or the public. Uh, cable operators must maintain a number of records for Commission inspection. Uh, these include a political file, sponsorship identification records, equal employment opportunities, uh, records, uh, commercial records for children's programming, records demonstrating compliance with the Commission's least access provisions, ownership records, the designation and location of the cable system's principal head in and a list of broadcast television stations carried on, uh, carried in fulfillment of the Commission's must carry provisions. Records required to be maintained primarily for inspection by the Commission or by local franchising authorities include evidence of compliance with the Commission's technical standards, a current list of channels offered to subscribers, proof of performance tests, uh, signal leakage logs, and repair records, a copy of the Commission's cable television regulations, records on, of subscribers, aggregate information used for assessing fees, and records of subscriber complaints on signal quality. In addition to the above listed files, cable systems with 1,000 subscribers or more must maintain a public inspection file. This file must contain a copy of records to be maintained as part of the political file. Okay, to be continued. Or I can read you. And I'll be happy to return your call as soon as possible. If you need to reach me urgently, please contact Dorothy Rogan at 313-594-4748 or page me at 1-888. So that was to Robert S. Lemley, I'm on my way to see the public file. Now watch him run in every direction. And you go over to 1111 uh, Stewart Avenue and Bethpage and you see the public file and watch them run in every direction. Like the Appalachian Gang. This call is to the Ford Motor Company, Chelina. And I'll be happy to return your call as soon as possible. If you need to reach me urgently, please contact Dorothy Rogan at 313-594-4748 or page me at 1-888-467-3673. sponsors in Manhattan, Cy and Elmer Amlin. I met Cy way back in 1974 when he was a vice president of programming and he worked for Fred Silverman at ABC. Uh, Fred Silverman is the one who put ABC into top place. Uh, and uh, I've known Cy for a number of years. He's a wonderful person and so is his wife. And so they live on Riverside Drive, a very swank address. But you don't need to have a community sponsor anymore in Manhattan. However, hold on to them in case anything changes.
We're up to Monday, July 31st, the last day of July, the great month. Great month. This is Franklin out doing the errands. Hello, Frankie. It isn't me. No, it isn't now. It's mine again, though. some good pictures yesterday Sunday the battery ran out first of all it was that drenching rain it's about the sixth day that we've had for it uh, but uh, the minister came back from vacation and he looked very good in his clerical collar I wanted you to see that and hear the people's prayers uh, but the minister uh, asked how it was while he was away on the vacation how did things go Various people said various things. And I said, we had a lot of short services and people began to titter. And they tittered even more loudly and more loudly and more loudly and longer and longer. I wished I had videotaped that for you. Now I have to read you uh, something from the Federal Communications Communication, the Federal Communications Commission fact sheet things about cable TV that you should know as a cable TV subscriber. Uh, folks, you have some protections given to you by the uh, government of the United States by the Federal Communications Commission. I am reading to you from the Federal Communications Commission's fact sheet. I've been doing this for several weeks. Today I'm reading to you something from page 8. Uh, a call to a cable system must be answered, including time the caller is put on hold within 30 seconds after the connection is made. If the call is transferred, the transfer time may not exceed 30 seconds. Also, cable system customers may receive a busy signal no more than 3% of the time. Although no special equipment is required to measure telephone answering and hold time, cable operators should use their best efforts in documenting compliance. Uh, these requirements must be met 90% of the time uh, measured quarterly under normal operating conditions. I want to see the record. I want to see the record that Cablevision has kept. 
or should have kept. Uh, cable operators may schedule appointments for installations and other service calls either at a specific time or at a maximum during a four-hour time block during normal business hours. Cable operators may also schedule service calls outside of normal business hours for the convenience of the customer. No appointment cancellations are permitted after the close of business on the business day prior to the scheduled our, uh, appointment. Now this is not from the municipal government, this is not from the state government, this is from the federal government. Uh, the following information must be provided to customers at the time of installation and at least annually to all subscribers and at any time upon request products and services offered. Prices and options of programming services and conditions of subscription to programming and other services. Installation and services, maintenance policies, instructions on how to use the cable service channel, positions of programming carried on the system, and billing and complaint procedures, including the address and telephone number of the local franchising authority's office, such as city or village or town. Unauthorized reception of cable services, uh, signal carriage requirements. As a result of Arbitron abandoning the television research business, the Commission has determined that effective January 1st, 2000, the market of a television station shall be its designated market area, the DMA, as determined by Nielsen Media Research. Uh, if they're talking like WCBS, usually the DMA is uh, like 50 miles from the World Trade Center. That's how far a broadcast television signal usually goes. Must carry retransmission content. Consent election. Election of must carry status. Generally, if a local commercial television station elects must carry status, it is entitled to insist on cable carriage in its local market. A must carry station has a statutory right to a channel position, usually it's over the air channel number or another channel number on which it has historically been carried. Hysterically would be better. Superstations are transmitted via satellite, usually nationwide, and the cable system may carry such stations outside their local market without their consent. This should show up purple and this should show up royal blue. The color would be better because the camera doesn't like a lot of light. But I can't read without light. The camera sees better than I do. And the cable system may carry such stations outside their local market without their consent. The negotiations between a television station and a cable system are private agreements which may but need not include some form of compensation to the television station such as money, advertising time, or additional channel access. Non-commercial educational television stations, low-power television stations, uh, radio programming, we are up to page 11. Uh, syndicated program, exclusivity protection, uh, network program, no duplication, non-duplication, sports programming, blackouts, we are now up to page 12. Copyright. Uh, the Copyright Act requires a cable operator to file semi-annually a statement of account including information about system revenue and signal carriage as well as the royalty fee payment. For further information regarding copyright regulation, contact the licensee. Uh, Division of the Copyright Office, Library of Congress, Washington, D.C. Cable casting that is subject to the editorial control of the system operator. Program content regulations. The rules generally do not apply to the contents of broadcast signals or access channels over which the system operator has no editorial control. That would be decency, indecency rather, and nudity 
and uh, something else. Things we are not interested in. Uh, that was page 12. A lockbox. You know about lockboxes? You know about them? Okay, this is page 13, which is printed upside down. Uh, the industry proposed the TV parental guidelines, and the proposal was approved by the Federal Communications Commission on March 12, 1998. The TV parental guidelines, labels, and content indicators and respective meetings are. And then it's uh, TVV, TVY, TVY to the seventh, TVG, and so forth. And then the V-chip. They talk about the V-chip. Uh, Section 504 of the 1996 Cable Act required a cable operator to fully scramble. That's a split infinitive. To scramble fully or block the audio and video portions of programming services not specifically subscribed to by a household. The cable operator must fully scramble or black the programming in question upon the request of you, the subscriber and at no charge to you, the subscriber. We are now up to page 14. 14, 14. About Playboy versus the FCC, however, before the rules could take effect, Section 505 was challenged in the courts and the commission was subsequently preempted from enforcing the rules because of a temporary restraining order and a number of days granted by the United States District Court for the District of Delaware. I have a case there, uh, Glendora versus Ishvan Kassari, to deport Ishvan Kassari. He came over here from Hungary and he broke all kinds of laws. He should go back to Hungary and against a New York Shell City judge, uh, Preston S. Scher, and against another one, Gail Rice, and against General Rosa, the clerk of the court, and against a court officer there. Uh, finally, Section 506 of the 1996 Cable Act shows cable operators, allows cable operators to refuse to transmit any public access or lease access program which contains obscenity, indecency, or nudity. On June uh, 28, 1996, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision Denver Area Educational Telecommunications Consortium versus the FCC, which held that cable operators may decline to carry indecent programming on least access channels, but cannot exercise the same control over programming on public access channel. That's the alliance was the uh, really the uh, a plaintiff in that. Political cable casting. Once a cable system allows a legally qualified candidate to use its facilities, it must afford equal opportunities to all other candidates for that office to use its facilities. The cable system uh, may not censor the content of the candidate's equal opportunity material in any way and may not discriminate between candidates in practice, regulations, facilities, or services rendered pursuant to the equal opportunities rule. Candidate appearances which are exempt from the equal opportunities rules include appreciation appearances on a bona fide newscast, bona fide news interview, bona fide news documentary, or on the spot coverage of a bona fide news event. Most favored commercial advertisers. The most favored commercial advertiser. Oh boy, that is a racket, the way they sell airtime. Oh, those prices. You know, they're so arbitrary. It's just the biggest racket. That ought to be exposed and stopped. Prior to the Fairness Doctrine, so repeat. In 1987, seven cable television systems operators engaging in origination cable casting were required to afford reasonable opportunity for the discussion of contrasting views on controversial issues of public importance. Although this requirement uh, still appears in the Commission's rules, the Fairness Doctrine in its broadcast application and from which the cable rules is derived is no longer enforced as a consequence of a commission proceeding in a court decision. That's right, you know, the fairness doctrine really doesn't apply in cable TV. If somebody objects to an opinion given, then uh, you don't get equal time. What you do is go and have your own public access program or your own uh, government access program. Okay, uh, personal attacks. 
political editorials and lottery information. One more last paragraph, let's make it fast. When an attack is made upon the honesty, character, integrity, or like personal qualities of an identified uh, person or group during origination cable casting concerning controversial issues of public importance, the cable system must give the following to the person of a group attacked within one week. But this doesn't apply to public access. One, notification and identification of the cable cast. Two, a script, tape, or accurate uh, summary of the attack. And three, an offer of a reasonable opportunity to respond over the cable I facilities. The rule exempts attacks by political candidates and their associates on other candidates, including attacks that occur during uses by candidates, such as attacks made during bona fide newscasts, bona fide news interviews, and on the spot coverage of bona fide news events and attacks on foreign groups or foreign public figures. And that is all. We will read, that's page 15. We'll try to read you some more next week and the week after, and that's the end. Thank FCC, fact sheet, protections for you. Okay, 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 okay. United States educational television stations that are required by law. Information retaining uh, relating to peg channels may be obtained directly from the cable system or the local franchising authority. Why don't you write to uh, Cablevision? and ask them for the information relating to peg channels. Least commercial access. Now this is if somebody doesn't want to go on public access and he wants to go on uh, least access and have a sponsor for his program and try to make money with his program. Uh, he can do that. And the rule, the law on least access is much more specific than it is on public access. But I always say that public access can use what's in lease access by implication. Channel set-aside requirements were established in proportion to a system's total activated channel capacity in order to quote, now listen to this please carefully, assure that the widest possible diversity of information sources are made available to the public from cable systems in a manner consistent with the growth and development of cable systems. Remember that the rest of your life, put it under your pillow. That is almost the first statement in the Cable uh, Policy Communications Act of 1984, the Cable Act. Be sure that you remember that. The widest possible diversity of information sources are made available to the public. You are the public. You are the all-powerful public. Uh, so I have just read you pages 16, pages in 17 uh, of the fact sheet. And uh, some of the other topics they deal with are equal employment opportunity, uh, cable system ownership, that's on page 19. And uh, uh, cable MMDS cross ownership. Uh, with MMDS often referred to as wireless cable, an omnidirectional microwave signal is sent from a central transmission tower to receiving microwave antennas. The signals involve line of sight transmission, and as a result, the signals are subject to degradation when obstructed. On the other hand, well, we all are. On the other hand, absent obstacles, the signals can travel up to 70 miles, providing television pictures comparable to those received through cable television. The microwave signal is a high frequency signal which is converted for television use by a converter located on the subscriber's receiving antenna. Do you know anything about that? Uh, that was page 20. So, that's enough for this week.
let me mark it here and we'll resume page 21 next week. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Gene Crescenzi. Uh, all right, and now uh, uh, I want to point out uh, the, uh, that somebody's listening to us. Uh, Clyde Haberman wrote two articles this week in the New York Times on the, uh, beat on the uh, uh, Metro section first page about the uh, uh, inadequacy of the justice system. In other words, he said the same thing that we've been saying, that just the justice system does not work. If it does work, it only works for specialized owner interests who own the judges, who promote the judges, who uh, are able to uh, 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 manipulate the district attorneys and uh, uh, whatever, whatever action uh, happens in the uh, judicial uh, the performance of so-called judicial and uh, uh, justice uh, efforts that the a democratic society is supposed to offer, or at least uh, proposes to offer, promises uh, justice uh, under a system of equality of all, all, all citizens being equal under the law. Well, Mr. Haberman and the New York Times have gone out of their way, they've rolled out their, their barrels of ink and their reams of paper to point out that it doesn't happen that way. And they uh, lard these two articles, uh, their full, uh, full page length, uh, one third, approximately one third of the page in width, and the full length of the uh, page with uh, uh, facts supporting why the judicial system doesn't work and the fraud that is perpetrated by the, uh, the schools, the bar associations, the uh, law schools, the uh, law faculties, the people who run the law faculties, the people who run the different uh, boards and committees that run the universities, that run the law, fac uh, the law faculties, and uh, so forth down. Now, Mr. Haberman does a good job. Now, this is what makes this more important is that the New York Times as an institution has been supporting the gangsterhood uh, of this judicial gangsterhood uh, from uh, day one. And uh, they, uh, they're they the ones who interchange, and of course there's, uh, uh, there's the conflict of interest, there's the built-in conflict of interest because the, uh, the stuff that's usually printed uh, in the news releases and things of that nature have a, an, in, an, a, an internal conflict of interest in the sense that the, uh, uh, the government is the source of much of the material that's printed. They print uh, especially the, po the political uh, uh, hoaxes that come out of the different uh, Congress and uh, the uh, uh, different leg legislation of the states of the country, you know, the laws that they're going to promote, uh, they're going to make uh, for the benefit of everybody, but it's usually for the benefit of the newspapers and the people who own, own the uh, courts and are able to get access uh, to tell uh, these uh, so-called elected uh, representatives uh, what, uh, how, to, how to vote and for whose benefit to vote. Uh, and, and of course, they're the ones who, uh, uh, the newspapers are the ones that, that uh, champion the interests that are promoted by the owners of the, uh, uh, the secret owners, I should say, not the elected, the unelected owners, as opposed to the uh, uh, owners being the people who would be the elected owners, uh, the elect through the electoral, electoral process, uh, these are secret owners who operate outside the elective process, outside of the democratic process. And uh, nobody does anything about it. And of course, now we see uh, what, what happened now with Mr. Uh, Harold Levy. He came out, he made a, a bunch of real good uh, speeches about how to improve the educational system. And then as soon as he, uh, uh, they gave him a little elbow room to put his system into place. And uh, the next thing we know is that we're spending uh, maybe billions of dollars on uh, putting up uh, buildings, that, or, or, or let's put it this way, that they're setting aside money in 
intended for uh, school improvements and school building improvements, but that money is going to go into the uh, the protected uh, uh, bureaucratic empires that exist in the uh, 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 in in the system already, and they're not going to give uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Harold Levy uh, any more uh, an inch more of elbow room to put his uh, policies in in place. So what are we talking about today? Well, what we're talking about is the interest of the New York Times to publish two articles because it has become intolerable, even though they have been supporting the gangsterhood that runs the judiciary for, uh, for since day one, and they've been sort of supporting the media interest in protecting a corrupted judiciary uh, to publish this because it's become intolerable. What has become intolerable? Okay. It's secret ownership. Okay. Is that, that operates through, you see, it's very complicated. It, they operate through the bar associations, they operate through the uh, law school faculties, through the, uh, uh, the, the, boards, the, uh, the boards of directors of the different faculties uh, of the different universities that have their input in the secret government. Okay. Uh, Who is this? 
对。They the 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 court itself, the court administration has a publicly paid press room for the for these people, for these hitmen uh, who who are reporters for the uh, uh, different newspapers and different uh, 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 public uh, 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 news programs and uh, and uh, newspapers, uh, whether it's printed or or uh, or uh, uh, vocal. Uh, verbal uh, uh, by television, and whether it's television or radio. So why does Haberman have sleepless nights? Because he sees what these judges, the, the gang of people that we call judges, federal judges especially, what they do. Let me give you an example. Right, right now, as we stand and talk now, Gisela Weisskopf has, has uh, uh, charged uh, uh, improper. Uh, who Gisela Weisskopf is the lead plaintiff in the uh, in the action to recover damages for slave wages during the Holocaust by the uh, Third Reich and the uh, uh, and the Swiss banks and other other institutions in, in collaborator France and so forth who collaborated with the Third Reich. She is now denouncing her lawyers. And the people who put this uh, this deal, so-called deal, together to get this money to pay the heirs, or or, or uh, it's not really the heirs. Her principal objection is the mother. The money is not going to the heirs of the uh, of, of the whole victims. It's going to these associations that call themselves professional. Uh, uh, the industry, the so-called industry, the Holocaust industry, whose sole purpose is to manufacture uh, cases against the government where they can get money. And the time will come where they'll probably bring an action against Chase Manhattan Company, who collaborated to a certain extent with the... Uh, Gene, we're on another subject. What is this to do with Haberman? You asked me the crimes that Haberman witnesses in the federal courthouse. Okay. I'm telling you of the crime that is now going down. Okay. And they ordered secrecy, secrecy to seal the documents of Gisela Weisskopf. Are sealed. They won't even release the seal to let them know that this money that should be the heirs of the uh, of, of the Holocaust victims, it's going to go to a, a bunch of so called uh, of so called do good Zionist organizations. Okay, that is another program. Well, it's another program, but you asked me a question. I'm trying to answer you. Okay, we got the answer. <laughs> Just make it easier for an old sick old man to tell the truth. Okay, we got it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, I think my five minutes are up or whatever. Well, I think it's 11 minutes. Okay. Well, look at, uh, I still love you, so <laughs> I, I hope the, uh, it's re the feelings are reciprocated. I'm sorry. Indeed they are. Okay. Yes. Okay, I tried my best. Oh, you did. You did very well. Okay. Thank you, Gene. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. We'll Bye. talk again. Yes, thank you. Bye. <laughs> he's right, folks. I know he's right. I have personal knowledge of this. And so do many others. You're going to hear a... Well, I guess it's not going to be on your edition. Ginny is in office, too, sleeping on her back, her hands and her feet straight in the air. And it's very comical. And I should take a picture for you, but the camera is all hooked up to the microphone and to the remote and to the monitor. And I just cannot take it all down to show you. I guess you can imagine how funny it is. Uh, lawsuit. July 27th, 2000, Anno Domini, United States District Court, District of Indiana, Glendora Plaintiff versus Joseph J. Traficanti, Jr., Neanderthal, New York State Court Officer, number 1763, Chief of Court Officer, Security for Westchester County, Chief of Court Officers for State of New York, City of Mount Vernon, and Francis A. Nikolai, Defendants, 2000, Civ, blank, blank, in parenthesis for the federal judge's initials. This is a complaint, jury trial, 
ended. Under penalty of perjury, Glendora declares she is telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help her God. Uh, who are the defendants? Defendant Trafficanti is the uh, administrator of courts outside of New York County. New York County includes New York City, Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan. Remember, this is going to Indiana. The officer number 1763 was on duty at Mount Vernon City Building on July 27, 2009. Court officer was on duty with him. The caption tells who five are. Francis A. Nikolai is the Westchester County Administrative Judge to whom Number three, reports. What the defendants did to violate plaintiff's rights. Five, Glendora entered the building to pay a parking fine of $15 incurred the previous day. Six, she was carrying her TV camera, a color viewfinder, and shoots in the dark. Seven, she went straight to the elevator and to the second floor. To the right of the elevator was a quarter going to the courts. There was a metal detector and there were two New York State court officers. Glendora asked where to pay a parking summons. Now here are the claims against the defendants. See the picture? New York State Court officers in Gestapo style parking fines were to the left. They to answer. Twelve, instead of answering a patron, court officers in Gestapo style yelled, no cameras in this building. This was not the truth. They may have been referring to a restriction on no cameras in the courtroom. There was no notice of same. Glendora asked why. Court officers avoided an answer. Ms. Glendora had a right to know why. She asked why. Number 1763, court officer, Glendora and shout at her. The claim is physical abuse. The claim is oral abuse. Citizens of every state Republican form of government. Defendants violate by this is not a police state protected as to a Republican form of government. Court officers should have been able to cite the rule cameras and its raison d'etre. All defendants are violations. Claim against uh, 1763 is disorderly conduct. Number 1763 pushed and shoved Glendora a 72-year-old female. This was bullyism. Number 1763 manhandled and insulted Glendora and assaulted her, both physically and orally. Number 1763 abused Glendora's Canon camcorder, a $300 delicate recording instrument, by forcing his dirty hand against the lens and by grabbing the camera in Glendora's hand. Number 1763 in his jack and his lack of control and frenetic says, don't come here again or I will arrest you. This is a lie and impersonation of a police officer. He has no authority to arrest anybody. This blowhard demeanor is a, is a signal to co-defendants number 1763 is entirely unfitted and unsuited and unqualified to hold his position. And that said, co-defendants failed in their administration thereof. Number 1763 was not performing an official duty. He was on a personal frolic. 28, number 1763 pushed the elevator button down as he was saying, I'll arrest you, false braggadocio, and police officer impersonation. Glendora got out of the elevator and told Franklin, so Franklin paid the $15 parking fine. Franklin reported there were no court officers at the second floor site, nor anywhere else on the second floor when he, that he could see. This was selective village vigilance. Franklin reported that to pay parking fines, a person goes to the left. Ergo, number 1763 was acting out of his jurisdiction. He has no call to police people going to a Mount Vernon city window to pay a parking fine. His histrionics were totally out of bounds. His jurisdiction is the uh, corridor and the metal detector to the courts, the path to the right. His robbery of jurisdiction is another claim. Franklin paid the $15 in peace. Glendora should have been able to, uh, except for 1763. Uh, he should have said to the left. Glendora would have gone to the left and exited. The claim is that number 1763 manufacturing a disturbance. And this is 
surely number 1763 should have been trained in how to avoid fights and dispel rather than how to make fights. Number 1763 was on a personal frolic and was not doing his job, and this is claim number 12. Number 1763 withheld information the public is entitled to know, number 12. Number 1763 had no cause to frighten Glendora, emotional stress, and upset our claims, number 13. A half hour later, Glendora's arms at the elbow bends inside were still smarting and burning, where Neanderthals, number 1763, and that's claim number 14. These are also pendant state claims. 1863 is working for the Unified He is not working for the city of Mount Vernon. He had no right to talk about number 15. He had 